Heidi Hutner, and this is Coffee with H Times 2. Today on our show, I will be interviewing Drew Lanham and Lorette Savoy. They are both professors. Lorette is at Mount Holyoke and Drew is at Clemson. And Lorette is a geologist and a, you teach environmental studies. And you're also a creative writer, as we have, will be talking about today. And Drew, you are an ornithologist and a wildlife specialist. And you've also moved into creative writing. Mm -hmm. So we came, we brought you on together because you're both doing have a sort of a similar trajectory of starting out in science and moving more into creative writing and communicating in a different way. And you both also address race in your work and in a really in different ways but also intersecting ways so welcome on the show thank you thank Heidi you. thank you thank it's you for having us here. here really really great to have you and if you don't mind I'm gonna start with you Lorette um, just to sort of open this up in in your work um, there's a lot about kind of the, the mixed race identity and then and then and then the relationship to landscape um, could you talk about that there are there's so many ways to answer the question, Heidi. Uh, I could say that uh, part of the reason why I came to write Trace is because I grew up not understanding who I am, the people I come from, and the landscapes we came from. And I think it's really important in order to understand what it means to be a citizen of this country to understand one's foundations. And I learned very early on doing geology that as a geologist, I could track the history of almost any landscape from the pieces that were left, from the rocks and fossils, from the texture and structure of the land, but I couldn't do the same for the generations that made me. And that partly I grew up in a family that was uh, a family of silence. We never spoke about our past. So I felt untethered. I felt homeless, almost alien. And I needed to do this work essentially using what I've learned as an earth historian to apply that to try to unravel how the marks of this country's history affected my family, how they leave marks on the land itself, but also how they affected American society. That's so beautifully put. You really summarize well an important part of your, of your work here. Thank um, you. Drew, how, how, would, how would you answer that question? Well, you know, I think for, for me as, as a Southerner, and, um, and, and someone who's also concerned with identity uh, from that place and what it means to be a black Southern American, it was important to, for people to hear that voice, mm -hmm. I think, for, for folks to understand that there are these different voices that come from the South. And so I wanted to be true to, to that identity as a Southerner as, as someone whose ancestors toiled on the land, who didn't own the land, but were yet tied to this place in ways that were, that were deeper than the chains that bound them there. And so as, as a Southerner and someone who loves the ecology of my home, of my place, it was important for, for folks to, to hear that voice, to hear that love of, of place, but also to understand within the context of, of how I got there, of how my ancestors got there, for that to be, for that to ring true through the book. So, you know, race and place is, I mean, it's sort of my baseline, you right. know, as Lorette, as a geologist, talks about strata and, and bedrock right. and, and where it is that we are, you know, that's, that's sort of who I am. It's not sort of who I am, it's who I am. And so from all the traveling that I do, everywhere that I go, there's always this comparison back to Edgefield, South Carolina, and that place, and who I am. So these sort of strata of identity that, that Lorette talks about, I think, run through us all. And so digging mm -hmm. through that to understand who we are is, is what the writing is about. It's so interesting. Oh, please, please. Oh, no, yeah. you just, you just uh, said something that's really important. Um, as far as excavating the strata of identity, it, it's coming to understand without even knowing beforehand that ancestors were enslaved on the land and worked the land, but there were also ancestors who never were enslaved who mm. were of African descent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as indigenous ancestors and colonists from Europe. And not knowing any of this growing up, uh, but now coming to understand the convergence of bloodlines from three continents that 
came to make who I am, but also came to make the family in relation to place. So the place of race is yeah. a huge part of it. Yeah. I mean, you, well, really well said. No, both of well, you really well said. Yeah. Well, I, you know, again, yeah, who we are, you know, and, and again, those convergences of, uh, of genealogy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and if you do some of these genetic tests and begin Have to understand. Yeah, I did. I did a 23 in me, and I, I found out who it is that I am, not just from the exterior and what people call me right. um, and, and who I am sort of by hyphenated convention, but who it is that I truly am as, as, as a citizen of this, this world. Right. And, and that enlarges all of us in ways and connects us. And so I think through our writing, that's, that's part of the attempt, right, Lorette? To, mm -hmm. to connect mm -hmm. to is. ourselves and then to others. Right. So it's interesting teaching your work, because I'm, you know, teaching both of your books in my class right now. And, and so I, there's, there's many parallels, but there's also differences, because in your, your story, it's really about, um, at least my, my reading of it, um, not knowing your history and a kind of a travelogue, really. I mean, you're, you're not in one spot, where, and it's in trying to excavate history um, through this exploration and your sense of history through this exploration. Whereas for you, you started off saying, I'm home, I haven't left home, I'm staying home, this is where I belong, and really a sense of you're knowing your place, and I, 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 I love these birds because I know these birds, and they're part of me, and there's really a sense of I, I own my location, and my location, my location owns me. And so they're, it's, I love the way they're, they're different, and yet they raise similar issues. I wanted to ask you about how you came to ornithology. Why birds? Flight. <laughs> I mean, it, it's you know, this, this fantasy of flight that I think many of us have of, uh, of being free, of being untethered, of being unfettered, and that ability to, mm -hmm. to just sort of up and go at a whim. That, that's always been enthralling to me. And so as a kid, I spent a lot of time trying to fly. I, I built wings out of cardboard and uh, jumped out of trees and, and was always brought back to earth ingloriously by, by gravity. And so I was a little brown Icarus as I, as I say in the book, but, but to watch birds, I lived vicariously through birds. And I, I began to understand early on as I read encyclopedias, and I always came back to the B volume of Compton's 1966 brown-backed version of the encyclopedia. I would go to the birds, and I would look at these birds, and there were these plates, these overlays that showed the birds in their habitats. And so I would dream of, of flying, but I would also dream of the birds taking me to these other places, mm -hmm. these other places that I wasn't sure I would ever get to go unless I flew there. Mm -hmm. And so it started pretty early for me being a bird brain. I, I just, I couldn't escape these creatures around me mm -hmm. that seemed to defy gravity. Even before I knew what gravity was, I knew that these birds were streaming and flying through the air or soaring overhead as the vultures did in ways that were magical to me. And so across many cultures, birds are, are magical beings. They, they take us places that we otherwise would not be able to go. So maybe they're our disembodied spirits. But for, for that, for those birds to be able to take me outside of the bounds of home, but then also to be able to bring me back was this sort of magical transport. And so flight, the flight of fancy was was really that first fascination with me. I have a similar experience, but not with ornithology so much, but the, the sense of flight, not just being untethered, but also the sense of flight as allowing you to have an overview of what home is. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so flying yeah. over the country and not just understanding home in the sense of what it is geographically, but also as far as the texture, the patterns of the landscape, which have great beauty. So um, it's also partly driven uh, because my father was in the Air Force. Mm. And so I went and got my pilot's license. Uh, so I am not an ornithologist of your scale. Uh, you're, you're wonderful. But I do get up in a little Cessna, and I do take images of this land. Mm. Well, that's, you see, that, that um, that sort of, that ownership of, of that freedom, yeah. you know, it's, that's, that's an important thing. 
and so not just living vicariously, but being able to do that. I, I don't pilot, but I find myself sort of crammed into these big silver birds and flying across landscapes. And that view that Lorette talks about that you see underneath you, um, it's, it's increased my range beyond home. Yes. You know, so as a, as a wannabe bird, you think about your, your home range and what that means and being able to expand that. And I, I talk a lot about sort of these home ranges and what that means for us as, as people and what, what expands us beyond mm -hmm. who we are and where we are and, and also what restricts us mm -hmm. beyond or into being maybe more than we could be. And so all of that um, sort of builds into this sort of metaphorical bird but I'd, I'd like to fly with you. I'll take day, you up Lorette. any day. That would be amazing. Okay. I'd like to come too. <laughs> it's only a two-seater. Oh, okay, well then, I don't think so. Actually, I'm afraid of heights. I probably couldn't do it. <laughs> so what brought you to, to geology and to earth sciences? Uh, I would say that, uh, and you'll see where I'm going when I, in the way I answer this. Uh, I think most children who experience at a very young age some abrupt, harsh sense of othering, whether it be an experience in racism, uh, which is what I, I felt, they remember the moment, uh, and I certainly do, when I was eight years old. And at that point, I learned that the American land doesn't hate. Mm -hmm. It doesn't spit on you. It doesn't judge you. People do. And so at the age of eight, I began to seek refuge in the land because it was safe. And that was a time when my parents were driving across country and we visited many national parks, the iconic parks in the West, like Yellowstone, Badlands, that was a national monument at the time, but also uh, Sequoia, Kings Canyon, Zion, Bryce, the Grand Canyon. And it seemed to me that those landscapes welcomed me as who I am, not not as a race, not as a brown-skinned child, but they welcome me as an individual enjoying them. And so from early on, I was always drawn to that. They were my refuges. And there was a time when I wanted to be a park ranger, uh, an interpretive <laughs> ranger, you know, wearing the hat and the uniform and telling people about the landscapes. So that's what drew me to it mm -hmm. initially. Uh, but then I began to realize that so much of what we understand or what was taught in history, in classes, in school, about people in the land and about the land it's, itself excluded people who looked like me, uh, that we weren't part of it, that there was no voice, no place for it. And so my work turned to trying to give voice to what had been unvoiced or erased. Mm -hmm. um, but the early draw was because of the land being refuge and because of a self theory I developed when I was about five years old. And at that point, I lived in Southern California and the intense blue sky and the sun there. I knew as a five year old that the sun colored my body just as it colored the dry California hills and that sky flowed in my veins. So I felt that there was a kinship with the land, that we were cousins. So it was family, and I was only getting to know family better. Oh, it's beautiful. That is gorgeous. Beautiful. Yes. Really gorgeous. So I have a, we don't have a lot of time, and I, I have a pressing question for you, um, a couple of them, and, but one that comes to mind, what, what made that you sh you shift and you both both made this shift into creative writing? Uh, they're not you know we have Rachel Carson and we do have other examples, but really it's I work with a lot of scientists. They that's what they do. They're in the lab and they don't seem to have any problem with just doing that. Right? They're very happy doing that research. But you obviously are drawn into language and writing, and and I know you have plans to do more. And so you're, you know you're active, you're productive writers, creative writers. What what made that happen for you? <coughs> Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll try it, Lorette. I, you know, for me, it was, um, you know, there's this publisher parish, you know, paradigm with, with us as, as academics. Right. And so it's, it's, our, it's our lifeblood. Words are, but it's crafting words to me as a scientist in a very different sort of way. It's um, very mechanistic and, and almost formulaic. Right. And, and so you format for a journal and you have word counts and, and, and you begin to understand what the editors from, um, whatever journal it is that you're publishing in, what they want, 
And, and you get good at that and you advance as an academician. But from, the, from that point of advancing and sort of preaching to the choir with what we do, I felt a pull to, to have those words, I don't know, be less mechanical and to evoke some feeling because as a child, the, the books that I would pick up and read beyond the encyclopedias were, were books that, that gave life to, to nature in ways that made it live and, and that I could see and be in this sort of imagined world. So I wanted the words and the work that I did as a scientist to live beyond just those other scientists, beyond those peers. And I wanted other people to feel the words in ways that they would not feel them in a peer-reviewed journal. And so a writing workshop away from home in Vermont gave me license and the freedom to, to, to be someone not different, but to sort of unpack what was inside so that I could write creatively. And then give words to the work that I do as a conservationist, to give those words life in a different way, the same way that the books had, as, that had done for me as a child. And those words lived hopefully, and people will see, yeah, you know, conservation and the love of nature, it, it transcends what we traditionally think of. Um, as really this pretty homogenized deal, as white male driven, but that other people love the land, as Lorette mm -hmm. so beautifully said, that it's family, that it's kinship with nature in sort of this different way. What about that's, you? That's, well, that's um, wonderful, and I, I would say that my experience parallels that in, in some ways, but also because creative writing didn't follow the scientific writing, it actually preceded it, and they've, they've occurred, uh, occurred together. I've always been drawn to stories that we tell of the land and the stories we tell of ourselves in the land. And those narratives or stories can be artistic, they can be, let's say, photography, they could be sculpture using the textures of earth, they could be myth, they could be oral tradition, they could be scientific narratives, they could be history, and definitely literature. Since childhood, I've always been drawn to how we think about place, landscape, earth, but also how we think about ourselves in place. So when I started in college, I was going to be a studio or art major. Uh, and let's just say uh, my undergraduate experience uh, at Princeton at a time when there were still male faculty there, white male faculty who felt that a woman had no business being there, and a brown-skinned person had no business being there, they not only discouraged me, they, they literally chased me out of that. I then moved to history, again, all because stories of people in the land. But too much of the major required uh, doing European history or not really what I wanted to do. And so being told that I couldn't make it, that I had no business being there, I had to prove to them, I do have a right to be here, and I'll show you. So I majored in a science because thinking at that time that science was a more rarefied discipline, mm. the one that they would respect. If I could prove that I could do the science, then uh, I wish I hadn't felt the need to prove it to them. But all the time for me doing geology is understanding our place on Earth mm. and understanding how the history of human experience has been tied to the land, the land's textures, its composition, its materials. And so I don't think of myself as a geologist so much as a writer who uses her experience as an earth historian to inform her writing. So in other words, I've come back full circle to where I began. Right. Uh, and so with uh, narrative nonfiction and with poetry and other forms, uh, it's all the same to me. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank very very beautiful. So we we have to close, but as we close, because um, we could talk, I could talk to you both for a long, long time, <laughs> and and we and we will talk more. To we will we'll be talking to my students soon in a in a Q and A. So, um, as a final, as a way to close, uh, would you each tell me your authorial, um, what you, what you're drawing on in terms of other authors. Because one of the things in, in Alice Walker's essay in Search of Her Mother's Gardens and, and other essays of hers, she talks mm -hmm. about needing to find, you know, our foremothers, our forefathers in literature, 
and the difficulty she had with that, and so that's where she excavated um, mm -hmm. Zora Neale Hurston. So, you know, that for me was very, very meaningful, and that whole story, and then this incredible book, which is now mm. getting a lot of recognition and importance. So if you could just ma maybe quickly tell us your, your influence, who's influenced you who's, who, who, as writers? Laura? Let me take a stab. Um, I honestly think that one of the hardest things uh, to cultivate is a capacity to ask significant questions about one's life in a larger world and about li lives not your own. That is, people who, whom you may have been taught are other. And so I'm drawn to writers who face, and not just face the questions, but try to respond to them mm. openly, honestly, and with responsibility and respect. And so there are so many writers across ages, across cultures, across genres from fiction, nonfiction, poetry, even uh, plays uh, mm. who have done this. And so I hesitate naming one because mm. that one person might be considered the top one and there isn't a single top one. But if you can imagine writers who have really gone to the quick of the wounds that touch one's heart, who draw blood in order to understand what it means to be alive and what it means to have this moment on time of time on earth. Uh, those are the writers uh, to whom I'm drawn. And just I'm going to name a couple only because they're at the top top of my head, tip of my tongue. But it doesn't mean they're the only ones. But James Baldwin, for example, mm -hmm. Audre Lorde, yes, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Lauren Isley, Aldo Leopold, my father whom I only learned about later in life, didn't even know he was a writer. But so many of them, um, and countless poets especially, um, there are many who have helped me face the questions myself. And when I felt fearful and unable to respond, thinking, I can't face this, they are the ones who helped pull me back to the path. Wonderful. And many others who have gone on me. Thank you. It's it's uh you know it's it's sort of this pantheon of, you know what we read, and and that impacts the writers, the writer that we become. For for me, I you know the the baseline is 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 probably Leopold, just just because of this evolution in his life, uh, that reveal this this ethos, and 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 sort of describing who we can be over a period of time. As, as living beings on the planet respecting other living beings, which Leopold talked about in terms of sort of our relationship to wildness. But I think that the greatness of his work is that by the time he died in the mid 40s, we were on the cusp of, of this great movement where we began to respect or attempt to respect one another in these ways. And so I can expand sort of this Leopoldian land ethic mm -hmm. to a greater ethic. But then I was thinking the other day as I was reading about Thoreau, and then now reading um, Tonisi Coates's book, Eight Years We Were in Power, that there's this convergence that's going on within me of these, of these three authors mm -hmm. of, of, of nature and, and culture. And, and so as those things converge, that's sort of this constant thing as a writer that you're you're picking up new material and gleaning this information from different places that falls hopefully on on the on the on the fertile ground of the page and then it grows into something that's uniquely you. Right, right, right. If I could add to that, it's also the falls within the fertile mind that you have and within the fertile heart. Heart. Mm. Heart, yes. Yeah, very much. And on that note, that's a beautiful note to end on. We're going to close but for viewers who want to continue watching, watch the next episode, the Q&A with my class, because we're going to continue this conversation. So we're going to close. Thank you so much. You. I'm Heidi Hutner. Thank this you. is Coffee with H Times Two. We're so privileged to have these two beautiful authors with us, Drew Lanham and Lorette Savoy. And I highly recommend these books. They're just exquisite, and they're great together. So, And you said you both have them on your bookshelves together, which is interesching. I, do. I didn't know that. So, But we're, te we're teaching them right now together and reading them together, and it's just beautiful. So thank you for watching. Thank you.